Welcome to the AI and Faith podcast. We are a community of expert technologists, professionals, and faith leaders bringing the ancient wisdom of the world's major religions to the ethics of artificial intelligence. Join us on this new journey and welcome to the conversation. My name is Pablo Andres Rusalmones, and I will be your host for today. For today's episode, we talk to AI and faith advisor and psychiatrist Kurt Thompson. Kurt provides insights from his clinical practice about how AI is affecting our concept of beauty and our mental health. Kurt also describes our brain's remarkable capacity to wire around our relationships and faith practices, reflecting a process called brain plasticity, and some of the ways that social media appears to impact that wiring. Listen now to our conversation. Uh, Kurt Thompson is a board-certified psychiatrist and the founder of Being Known, an organization that develops resources for hope and healing at the intersection of neuroscience and Christian, Christian spiritual formation. He is the author of The Soul of Shame, The Soul of Desire, and Anatomy of the Soul. Kurt weaves together an understanding of interpersonal neurobiology and a Christian view of what it means to be human to provide insights about how the brain affects and processes relationships and thereby help people discover a fresh perspective and practical applications to foster healthy and vibrant lives. So it's definitely an honor to have you here, Kurt. In fact, um, I've got your book right here next to me. I read it, of course, uh, the one from uh, The Soul of Desire. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Mm. And uh, well, there are many questions, you know, that um, regarding the, the book and uh, that I hope uh, that we'll have enough time uh, to, to, to ask you about it. And I certainly encourage everyone to, to read it. If you haven't, uh, please do so. I think it's a, it's a wonderful, it's an incredible book that raises a very, very interesting question. And we'll be talking about that um, in 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 a moment, uh, together with uh, you know, interwined with with AI, of course. Uh, but as a starting um, as a starting question, uh, um, Kurt, and uh, precisely uh, talking about your book, um, as I said, I've read it. I think it's I think it's 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 wonderful. And almost at the beginning, uh, you say, and I quote: "We're people of desire. We want things. We long for things. It is primal to our nature to yearn." As St. Augustine reflected, the whole of life of the good Christian is a holy longing. So, so, so that we can start somewhere and build on top of that. Mm. Can you mm. explain to us what do you mean by we're people of desire? Well, thanks for the question, Pablo. And by the way, let me just say to, to begin, uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, to be invited. I'm, uh, as I shared with with David and Pablo, I'm, I'm not an AI expert, but uh, I'm learning as much as I can, as fast as I can. And in many respects, uh, I think that there are ways in which this conversation deeply intersects with the work that I do. And so I'm, again, it's just very humbling to be invited to be here in this space and uh, um, hope to add to the ongoing conversation that we're all having. I, you know, I, I think, Pablo, to be plain about it, I, I think that um, it comes in observing who we are as human beings. Uh, it's not so much, I don't, I don't think we have to do a lot of research. Uh, we, don't, I mean, we don't have to conduct uh, highly developed research protocols to figure out, A, what desire is, and B, does it exist, and do we have it, and so forth and so on. And now we can do that, uh, and it's likely that we will want to do that. But I think, uh, as we're in, in, the, in the book, I begin by just looking at what happens when babies come into the world. We, we talk about this notion of babies l come into the world looking for someone looking for them. This is, this is what we do. Uh, when you look at attachment research, you see that, of course, parents are interested in their children, but children are tracking with people who are looking at them, looking for them. There is this sense of longing that gets evoked in parents then because they see their children looking for them. But we also see it in physical appetites. We see it, we, we are hungry, we are tired, we long for sleep, we long for rest, we long for stimulation. There's a lot of things that we, just by observing newborns and infants and toddlers. And then you get to this other element that also research in, you know, the, the correlation between the development of the middle prefrontal cortex and secure attachment, this notion of uh, children's deep longing, and we you would say this then continues throughout adulthood. Our deep longing to, uh, we talk about in this book, these these these, were these four words that are a condensation of lots of different things that we, we talk about being, that we want to be 
clean, we want to be soothed, we want to be safe, we want to be secure, that eventually leads then to our longing. You don't have to train children to do this. We long to make things. And we long for other people to witness the things that we make and to celebrate that. And your, your three-year-old is going to come into the kitchen and they're going to hold up the thing that they've done. You don't know what it is. You can't recognize it, but they will swear it's Van Gogh, and they want you to put it on the refrigerator. They want you to charge the neighbors money to come in and look at it because they are excited about having made something. There is this certain longing. And you also don't have to teach children. You don't have to train children to be curious about the world. There is a natural longing that is built into our curiosity. Uh, and it's only when, at least in our culture, it's typically around third grade that we then start to train children to become anxious. We train them to become anxious in their, uh, in their uh, process of being curious, which is what we call education. And it's not, it's not that we don't set out to do this. So we're not meaning to do this. That's not what we hope to do. But the way that we arrange things often often does that. So that's a long way to answer your question, but this whole sense of longing and desire. And when I, I would say it correlates highly with the first two pages of the Bible. And it also highly correlates with what we read in the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, that when the, when the Hebrews write that he's placed eternity in their hearts, the Hebrews' use of the word eternity is not just a measurement of time. It's a measurement of the depth of the quality of life that God lives. And so there are very few things for which longing uh, doesn't show up in the human endeavor, it would appear. Right. Yeah. And, and I found that to be like uh, very interesting because then you go on to say that uh, beauty is desire made manifest, right? And you start talking about, and I obviously feel uh, very much identified with this uh, because aside from having an AI company, I've been a pianist all my life. So mm. I very much understand it when you say that beauty is kind of like the first thing that we, that we grasp, right? So uh, instead of saying oh, we think about something and then we see its beauty, rather we see its beauty first and we start understanding that thing. Mm -hmm. So just to give an example, uh, yeah, currently, for example, I'm, I'm playing Chopin's ballad, uh, the first ballad in G minor. Uh, so obviously, I heard it first. I saw, I, you know, I, I was overwhelmed by its beauty. Then I, I decided to start playing it. And then, uh, you know, I started um, understanding it. And that happens the same with many other uh, works of art, whether they're written, whether they're uh, music or, or, or anything else. And from a theological perspective, you also say that the beauty of the word was was that uh, first it captivated the author long before he understood what he was dealing with. I wanted to ask you something about that because, you know, now that you're talking about uh, longing, I also believe, and, and I don't know uh, what you think about this, but that there are like different levels of um, of beauty, if you will. And I don't mean that one thing might be more beautiful than the other. What I'm saying is you can appreciate a work of art, for example, and, uh, you know, be captivated by the beauty of Bach, for example. But then when you start understanding what Bach actually did, then you can dedicate your life to it. Like you understand a different level of, of, of beauty in many cases. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. there is a quote by Nina Simone who famously said, once I understood Bach's music, I wanted to be a concert pianist. Bach made me uh, dedicate my life to music. So you're overwhelmed by beauty. Then you start understanding what happened. And and at least to me, in, in the case uh, uh, of music, then you start, then you go one step beyond. And once you understand it, you discover a whole new level of mm -hmm. beauty and you can dedicate your life to it. I don't know what you think about that, if that mm -hmm. uh, true and, and, and your thoughts on the same. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we uh, like to, to say is that uh, the brain uh, tends to operate, and th th this is overly generalized, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the human being. Uh, our central nervous system tends to operate bottom to top and right to left. And what we mean by that is first we sense and then we make sense of what we sense, that we take in sensory perception through our spinal cord and through the lower part of the brain, essentially. And most of that, a lot of that that is not just primary uh, musculoskeletal sensory perception runs to the right hemisphere. And by that, I don't mean what you feel in your hands and your legs, but um, our internal proprioception, what we sense internally in our body will typically run to the right hemisphere to a part of the brain called the insula. And the right hemisphere, generally, if, if, you, if you read Ian McGilchrist's work, you, you will, this is the place where we tend to sense an image and have a lot, not all, but a great deal of the neurobiochemical activity that 
correlates with our awareness of what we sense and feel. We sense and image and feel things that crosses the corpus callosum into the left hemisphere and it joins our language centers. It joins in the, in the place of the prefrontal cortex. It joins the part of our mind and our brain that then begins, that gives us the process, gives us the way to begin to make sense of what we've sensed. But in the very moment that we are making sense of things, so for example, when we talk about we're captivated by box music and then we study box music, we begin to engage box music and the very engagement of it becomes something that we also then sense. And so we've made sense of something and then we sense the thing that we're making sense of. And so this becomes this ongoing feature of how the central nervous system contributes to our awareness of beauty that we first sense it then we make sense of it then we sense of what we've made sense of and so on and so forth but we would also say i, I would say one thing more about this is that and this is where where human relationships for me uh, become the essence of all of this i mean how many of us have encountered some form of beauty whether it's bach or a sunset or another piece of sculpture or you know, a newborn who doesn't, or a great movie, doesn't want to share that with someone else. There is something about our encounter with beauty that becomes this magnet between me and other people. Beauty draws me to want to share it with someone else. The three-year-old runs into your kitchen holding what it has in its hands because it wants someone to enjoy this with them. And when that happens, we recognize that beauty is not just a standalone thing. It is a thing that draws relationships together. And the relationality itself becomes its own form of beauty that then wants us to then go and take the risks of creating more beauty along the way. And, and, uh, and on top of that, Fred, I, um, I, I wanted to ask you something because you are, you can be like overwhelmed by, by, by beauty. And, you know, as you're saying, you, for example, a three-year-old or a two-year-old will take their uh, drawing to you and so that they, you put it in the refrigerator and then you sense it, you know, you make sense of what you're sensing. What is that point? Uh, I mean, we can be overwhelmed by a sunset or by music or even by, uh, by the word of God or by many other things, but that doesn't necessarily make because dedicate our lives to that, uh, right? So, I mean, we can be, I can be overwhelmed by the beauty of Dali's paintings, for example, and that doesn't necessarily make me uh, uh, wish that I was a painter, but um, perhaps in music, it, it, it does happen. So what sort of, or what level of understanding do you need aside from being overwhelmed by that beauty to actually say, I want to dedicate my life to that. Like, um, I want to actually, I've over, been overwhelmed by the beauty and I forge a relationship perhaps with other people as well, but perhaps with with with, uh, with art, I think you can actually have a relationship with art. And what makes you dedicate your life to that? Well, I can imagine, Pablo, that there are, you know, different people would have different answers to that question mm -hmm. about what causes us to dig out of your life. But, but, you know, for me, I would say, oh, well, uh, when I look at the first two pages of the Bible, um, I, again, let me say this as a, as a neuroscientist, um, as Michael Polanyi once famously said, you know, there's no such thing as science. There are only scientists in that science itself doesn't tell us anything, only people tell us things. People mm -hmm. tell us things about data and we make sense of the data and so forth and so on. And so the neuroscience can tell us about the mechanics of how things work. It can't really do much more than that. Now it can be, it's becoming increasingly elegant in its description of the mechanics, but it doesn't tell us about purpose. We turn to other things for purpose. We turn to other things for teleology, for intention. And when you look at the first two pages of the Bible, uh, we read that on the six days, except for day two, that God said it was good. And the Hebrew word, the, the English word, we, we hear that word good translated in most translations, but the Hebrew word for that can equally be translated as beautiful, that God saw that it was beautiful. And not just that he saw that it was beautiful objectively, but that its beauty emerged as a function of him looking at it. And so therefore, beauty is not only something that objectively sits apart from us. It is something that we actually create by being engaged with something that heretofore was chaotic, as we read in the second sentence of the Bible. And what is important about this, and where we then see when we look at the Gospels, what we see is that not unlike the very the, the second sentence of the Bible, where God hovered over chaos, God hovers in that space, but then beauty, order, and purpose is what is created out of it. And God doesn't begin with a thing that is beauty. God doesn't start with beauty. God starts with chaos. He works with chaos. And so 
when we get to the Gospels, we see that beauty is not just something that is naturally overwhelming to us because we see the sunset or hear the piece of music or whatever. Um, but we would say that God looks at the world and sees chaos. We look at the world. We, in fact, look at crucifixion. And if we were only to see crucifixion through the lens of any other average Friday afternoon, all we would see would be horror. But we would believe that we look at Good Friday through the lens of Easter, which means that even something that horrific we can imagine as an act of beauty. Getting to your question, in that one of the things that we know about the development of secure attachment, interestingly enough, and so we would say beautiful relationships require that people learn how to navigate the repair of ruptures. Meaning, ultimately, beauty in relationship is not going to be something that we uh, are going to be able to create without our having ruptures in those relationships. Nobody wants ruptures. Nobody wants to have this. But what we discover is that resilience and the beauty of relationships actually emerges as a function of people having hard things happen that in the moment doesn't feel beautiful at all but that we are going to work to move toward because I, at some level, uh, have been touched enough by being loved. I would say that, you know, uh, of course, my willingness to uh, put my life on the line for anything ultimately comes from the degree to which I actually believe that I have been loved. My willingness to uh, work at creating beauty, at seeing beauty in the most awful of places, uh, has a great deal to do with the degree to which I have been loved. And by love, I don't just mean I've been treated nicely. I mean that people have been willing to be present with me in the face of my awareness, of their awareness of the parts of me that I hate the most. And this in and of itself, that people would want to be with me, that Jesus would want to be with us, that God comes to chaos and says, I'm not leaving the room. Like when I imagine my own life, there's a lot that I imagine that is not very beautiful. It's only when I am loved do I begin to catch a glimpse of how it's possible for anyone or anything to imagine beauty existing in the very place where horror is currently to be found. Now, I don't know how many machines can do that. I don't, hey, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying they can't. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not that smart. But it's hard for me to imagine that a machine is going to, uh, to be programmed to imagine in that way. Um, because it's not, you know, I mean, Jesus says, uh, I'm the way and the truth and the life. I am the bread of, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection of life. All these seven great I am's. Uh, that we as Christians uh, would articulate as words of great beauty, of comfort and joy. And they were the very words that got him killed. And if we will kill him, we'll kill anybody. And I'm not sure that machines can, I don't, I don't know what they can do about that. Yeah, no, and, and I think this that you're saying, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And uh, I, I'm, uh, under, I do understand the, uh, the meaning of the word I'm, I'm saying. Um, and it's very, and, and tying it to the next question, it, uh, you say, we humans have been created to bear God's image in order to reflect it by extending his endeavor to create goodness and beauty. As we become those very things, uh, you say that in, in your book so and i think that's just wonderful it, it goes on to what you were saying just right now right becoming uh beauty and um and and tying it a bit more to the uh to, to the ai perspective recently and and you've somewhat answered this of course right now but recently it's been talked about the many different you know uh whether what machines are creating is art or it isn't art whether what they're creating is beautiful or isn't beautiful when you ask them to do a painting when you ask them to do a sort, sort of poem or or, or anything Thing like that. And so if you could uh, expand a bit more on this thought that you uh, just uh, told us about, do you think that machines, uh, whether it's called AI or anything else, can actually create uh, beauty? Because also I want to tie it to, uh, you know, Noreen's book, uh, Inner Image, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, mm -hmm. we're, <laughs> I mean, somehow we, we want to create things that are also capable of creating uh, something that in, in this mm -hmm. case, uh, putting two, both ideas together is something 
uh, create things that can create beautiful things, right? Mm -hmm. It's somehow kind of mm -hmm. what we're trying to do and, uh, you know, to send in some way and mm -hmm. in some other uh, things that we have mm -hmm. precisely in our image. So do you mm -hmm. think that that desire that we have to create things that can also create more things, in particularly in the case of machines, um, do you think that will allow them to create beautiful things or to create beauty? It's a, it's a great question. And uh, again, one uh, for which I'm, I don't have the skill set to, to answer, but I, I will say this. Um, again, uh, I, when, it, when it comes to describing who we are intended to be and what being human really most fully, uh, what human flourishing requires, uh, I, I invite us to consider the end of the second page of the Bible. Uh, because when we get to the end of the second page of the Bible, we hear that the man and his wife were naked and unashamed. For me, as, as a psychiatrist, as a neuroscientist, um, I think that we, we have before us those things that are necessary for beauty to emerge. And one thing is that we that we see we have the man and his wife, and what we what we hear in this is what we, we hear differentiation, right? We have lots of different ways in which we want if we want to create beauty in the world, if we want to see beauty, we we know that beauty emerges as a function of differentiated parts, parts that are very different from each other that are also linked. We talk about a symphony. We talk about Chopin. We talk about a symphony. We talk about an instrument. Uh, we talk about those um, systems in the world that are what we in interpersonal neurobiology call integrated systems or systems that are both well differentiated, like an orchestra, you had different sections of the orchestra that each need to be able to play their role. But those different roles, those different sections also require linkage. They require connection to the other sections of the orchestra. We could talk about a family in this way. We could talk about the brain this way. We could talk about clouds this way. We could talk about a lot of different systems. If they're going to function in an integrated fashion, they require both differentiation and they require a linkage, but they also require a conductor. Every symphony needs a conductor. Somebody, somebody needs to direct this, not to control it, not absolutely, but to direct this. And in the brain, we like to talk about the middle prefrontal cortex as the conductor. But if my middle prefrontal cortex is going to function well, it's only going to do so because I have all these different things that I sense and image and feel and think, all the different parts of the brain that are coming together, linked. And if my middle prefrontal cortex is going to function well, it has to go to conductor school, which means I need another human being sets of human beings in the room from the time that I'm born to enable my middle prefrontal cortex to develop the way that it does. And what does this have to do with your question? Those differentiated and linked parts are necessary for beauty, but they are not sufficient because what we also need is nakedness. The husband and his wife were naked. I'm like, I don't know if a machine knows what it's like to be vulnerable. Like, I don't know. Like, are you, can, we, can we program vulnerability? Because ask any artist, any any author, uh, any musician, uh, any any chemist for that matter, any researcher uh, to be truly creative. I mean, you can create things and you can uh, keep them in your basement. But most artists that I know, most uh, most authors that I know, uh, they they actually want people to read their books. Oddly enough, you know, most musicians that I know, they want people to come to their concerts. They want people to you know to listen to their records. But the act of putting your work into public view is an act of great vulnerability because you're going to have critics. You're going to have people who don't like what you've produced and so forth and so on. And it's an act of great vulnerability. And this means that I, my act of creativity, I mean, when I'm speaking in front of an audience, I can tell you that, you know, I tell people, look, if I'm speaking to an audience of, of, of 300 people, that speaking engagement would be very different if I was only speaking to one person who's sitting out there like in, in a chair, it would, it would be weird too, but I mean, it would be, it would be it would be very different because like what I'm doing in the moment depends upon the audience. Ask any musician that talks about these things. And so it requires vulnerability. I need your protection. I need your guardianship and you need mine. Uh, and I need the help that you can bring to create. I need, you know, Mako, when my friend Mako Fujimura does, he does painting work, I mean, he needs the artisans in Japan that do the pulverizing of the malachite that ends up in becoming the paint that he puts on the canvases. He, he can't do all this by himself. He needs other people. So we are vulnerable creatures, and that's crucially important as an element. But then the last thing that we talk about is that in order for us to uh, 
create beauty effectively over time, uh, we need to be able to do it in the absence of shame. So I, I would say that, uh, you know, you know, I, I tell people when who come to see me that uh, life, as it turns out, is extraordinarily simple. It's very simple. It's not as complicated as we make, and it is equally extraordinarily difficult. But it is not difficult because it's complicated. It's difficult because of the payload of fear of our shame that we each walk around with. Now, what we do is that we manufacture layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of narrative between my experience of fear and shame and my lived life experience. And that you know, multi-layer section of narrative that I construct certainly makes life seem more complicated. And my continuing to allow life to be more complicated is what allows me to say that I can't really, this is too much because it's too complicated, rather than what's really true, which is I'm just terrified to look at how much shame I carry. And because of this, I have to instead manage all that. But if I'm willing to actually touch those things, if I'm actually able to name and be in contact with my shame and my fear, it is out of, and, and, and to do so in the context of vulnerable community, it is stunning how much I will then no longer be using, burning all that energy, neurobiological energy that I've burned to contain my fear and my shame that now becomes available for me to create in the context of vulnerable community those artifacts of beauty and goodness that I long to create. Uh, do I think a machine can mimic what a human being can do by programming, by another human being programming it in such a way that it can put something up on a canvas or write a sermon or all the things, perhaps? But we know that when a musician walks onto the stage to perform or when someone, when you sit down to the piano to perform, in front of someone, uh, we are not just appreciating, Pablo, uh, the beauty of the music that comes off of your Steinway, if it's a Steinway that you play. We also deeply, we know how hard the work was that you put into it. We know the vulnerability that is required for you to do what you just did. We know that you are depending upon us to listen as intently as you are, as we are, as we are depending upon you to to play well. And, uh, you know, those are elements that we read in the first two pages of the Bible. And I, again, I, I don't, I don't know if machines will be able to manage all that. Right. I, I, I wonder myself the same thing, uh, <laughs> you know, and whether at some point they will be able to mimic that or not. And, and, uh, you know, this dependability that we have, and I couldn't agree more about the vulnerability issue, you know, about when you're saying when you actually are out there, when you show your work to someone else, you're completely naked, you're completely mm -hmm. vulnerable. In fact, um, <laughs> You know, many people have uh, uh, mentioned that to me uh, a couple a couple times uh, about how I can talk about some things, and it's like, well, when I'm out there, I'm, I'm already naked. So, well, you know, <laughs> what's yeah. what's the problem yeah. of talking about some other stuff? I've been naked many times, you know, in, in front of other people. And um, Kurt, perhaps to uh, wrap up because there are so many questions that the audience has, but I don't want to uh, go without asking you something else. Um, it, you know, now let's kind of like flip it. How will this be affecting our appreci appreciation of, of, of beauty? Uh, you know, the fact that the machines are creating all these things that we might, uh, if, you know, we might think or note that uh, they are able to mimic the different things uh, that, that we've just talked about. But um, in the end, when we're consuming some sort of content online, some of that content was created by an, uh, by an AI, like uh, the Lee or Mid Journey or something else, or a poem was created by a computer or anything. And... Um, there are kind of like many layers in between because when you're seeing a performer play, you're seeing them, you're listening to them and uh, at that point uh, live, right? Mm -hmm. But the, in this case, for example, when you're taking a look at some photos in the in, in social media, perhaps you don't know whether they were created by a human or whether they were created by a machine. And um, in fact, I think, well, uh, an, another um, uh, important idea around this is that, well, I think that when you create something with a mid journey and you tell it to do something, you're kind of not as vulnerable as you would be when you're painting it because it's like, well, somebody else 
actually painted it. I just gave him the instruction to, but it was somebody else's work. But in any case, all of that, I think, affects the way in which we see uh, beauty, both the person that created something with me journey. And, you know, if other people like it, he'll say, yes, I did it. And and uh, if some other people won't like it, uh, he'll say, well, I didn't do it. You know, it was, it was the machine. <laughs> so, you know, well, I, I think it will happen. And we're taking a look at things created by machines that can somehow affect the idea that we have of beauty and, and much, uh, more, more, much more than the idea, the appreciation that we have of it, because many times we do not know if what we're seeing was created by a human, it was created by a computer. So how do you think all these uh, things that we're living with AI will be affecting the way we see and the way we appreciate beauty, if at all, they will be affecting it? Yeah, that's a great question too. And uh, and again, I'm I'm not sure, but there is a um there is a a phrase that we like to use that we work with here in in the office, and and the phrase is uh, that we are working to uh, become uh, in, uh, moving on. Uh, we're we're on, a, we're on a line in which we are moving increasingly from the imagination to the incarnation, to a place of imagination, to a place of incarnation. When you uh, and I'll try to connect this to your to your question. When you look at the arc of the biblical narrative, the Hebrew Bible, and then when you get into the Christian text, you see that our experience of God is moving increasingly from the imaginative to the incarnate and becomes ever, 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 and ever, and ever increasingly incarnate, even when we get to Pentecost. And when we're in the consultation room, when we're running these confessional communities, um, you know, it's, it's easy for us to, you know, someone will say in the group, well, I don't. I, I'm, I'm a little worried about saying this because I'm, I'm, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, which, of course, anybody like who's anybody like, no, name the person in the room that you're whose feelings you're going to hurt. Please tell you, is it going to be John? Is it going to be Sarah? Who's it going to be? Uh, let me just say that we um, we live an increasingly abstract life that is increasingly disembodied. And because of this, I have more business and I will continue to have more business because when I'm actually encountering the material world as it really is. So when I encounter a real painting uh, in the D'Orsay in Paris, I'm standing three feet away from a Van Gogh. And I mean, like, I can't believe it because I see real texture. So forth and so like, I, and it touches me in ways that even if I were to see that same painting online, I'm not touched in the same way because I am further separate from the material world that I'm really looking at. This is not unlike uh, what it's, the, the difference between listening to a perfectly produced recording of one of your piano productions that I listen to on iTunes versus listening to you at Carnegie Hall. Those are very different experiences. And when it comes then to uh, my our, our ability to um, create beauty and goodness, we are most powerfully able to do it when we are most deeply connected to the material world. And at the end of the day, the question that I'm going to want to ask, no matter who made it, is will my encounter with this have me form me into a person of greater love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control at the end of the day? Will I be more patient with my wife when I've encountered this or less so? Will I be more in love with Jesus or less so? And so forth and so on. And, uh, you know, I can see a picture of a great oak and be, like, stunned by it. But when I go to the old growth forest in North Carolina or Tennessee in the Great Smoky Mountains, and you put your hand on a tree that is 300 to 400 years old, it changes you. And I don't know if a machine can do that because my body knows when it's touching something that is material – and the question at the end of the day is going to be, am I going to be a, a greater participant in the kingdom of God or less of one when it's all said and done? Great, Kurt. It was a beautiful answer. As, as all your answers have been. Um, and and uh, yep, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Kurt. Once again, it was an honor to have you here on behalf of everyone at AI and Faith. And um, well, anyway, thank you so well, much. Thanks, everyone. It, gosh, thank you so much. It was just an honor and uh, just a joy to be with you. Thanks for having me. 
You just listened to the AI and Fade Salon recording from June 2023. Stay tuned to listen to more salon recordings and interviews with experts from around the world. In the meantime, follow and rate our new podcast on your favorite podcast platform and share with your friends. Don't forget to follow us on our social media as well. We are on LinkedIn and X. Thank you for joining us today.